Um, by by asking you to do it for a constant a rather than a, a time uh, depending a. So if this is a if this is a matrix, if a is a matrix, then we all know what uh, well what the exponential of a T A is right? Or of A. <coughs> T A. Okay? Well, no. I mean if it's unless A is a that is a canonical form, right? Right. If A is canonic if A is a canonical form then uh, so is the then it's upper triangular, right? And so is this, right? So that's exactly the point is then you can ask the question, what is the determinant of this matrix? We have a square matrix. Well, it turns out that it's the same as the exponential, or in this case, It's just e raised to this number, which is called a trace of of the matrix, right? Um, and again, t plays no role. Just think t is one in this in this uh, picture. What is what is the trace of a matrix? Some of the diagonals, right? So why is this true? If a is canonical form, is in canonical form. Well, in canonical form, you have possibly some ones, right, above the main diagonal, but certainly nothing below the diagonal, right? And, you know, there could be all ones, there could be no ones, there could be some ones, and one on the diagonal could actually be repeating, uh, the eigenvalues could be repeating, right? So certainly the trace was talk about, uh, okay, let's talk about TA. What is the trace? T lambda 1 plus T lambda N, right? So in this formula we can identify the right side. So the exponential of this number is e to the T lambda 1 plus T lambda n, so it's okay. So that's what it is. Okay. Now let's look at the exp of T a. Then we know that uh, how do you exponentiate how, how do you exponentiate of a, a matrix that's in canonical form? You basically exponentiate each block, Jordan block, right? They don't interact with each other as long as they're distinct blocks so so you're gonna get for each block you're gonna get a, an upper triangular right and all the diagonal of those of each of those blocks are gonna be e to the corresponding eigenvalues times t right some garbage here in fact a lot of garbage uh, possibly on the upper side, but nothing on the lower side. So for upper triangular matrices, it's easy to, to compute the determinant. And that is what it is, right? So it's um, e to lambda 1 t is the product of the entries on the diagonal. Are these two the same? So that's how you, that's how the connection is uh, between the two, right? For just for a matrix. Now think about uh, what what is actually exp of a ta. Uh, 
5 plus TA plus T squared over 2 A squared. Right, right. But I mean, what's, uh, where, where does this come from? From, a, from solving a linear system, x prime equals ax. with x at 0, some given x naught, right? This gives you x of t to be exp of ta times x naught, okay? So, um, <clears throat> the question is, how do you, uh, I mean, how do you relate the determinant of this matrix with solutions of our system, of a differential system. Well, you see, this is a vector. This is a matrix times a vector. That's the initial vector, right? So the determinant of this doesn't tell you too much. I mean, you cannot apply the determinant in the right, left side and right side, can you? Because right? there's a determinant of left side. That you cannot talk about determinant of a vector. It has to be a matrix. So. Uh, so how can you create a matrix system, a system uh, where where replace vectors by matrices? <clears throat> well, one way to do it is to just put things um, like uh, pick x zero, x zero two, x zero n, say a basis of Rn. So I just pick. It does, they don't even have to be a basis. Okay. But you'll see that it... So what do, we, what do we mean by a basis? They're linearly independent, right? And there are n of them, so you have... When you put them uh, side by side, So we're going to put this matrices in a, uh, excuse me, this columns, and put them together and form a square matrix. Okay. Then what is uh, what 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 is the what is happening with the solutions of that differential system? Well, there's going to be a solution corresponding to this initial condition. There's a, uh, a vector, right? as a function of t that corresponds to the first vector, the second vector, the nth vector. So if I write p of t, which is, you know, it would be x1 of t, x2 of t. So you put those solutions, but now as vectors, as columns in this matrix. This is n by n. OK? Yeah. X not squared is not really squared. No, no, no. It's, it's, no, no, it's, it's a second. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. So just imagine you solve this system, x prime equals ax, you know, for n different initial conditions. And then you put these solutions, then what do you get? You get a matrix that depends on t, and this satisfies p prime of t. Well, what does this satisfy as a matrix? When you, how do you differentiate a matrix that has entries depending on t? Every entry. Every entry, right? Differentiate entry by entry. So you could think of differentiating column by column, right? So this is going to be x1 prime, right? x2 prime, xm prime. Well, and now there shouldn't be much surprise to see that this is the same as a times, well, OK. I don't want to write too much. Um, it's just the same as the matrix A multiplied to this P because the first column, x1 prime, is the matrix A times the first column of P. Second column, 
and so forth, right? So column by column. So in the end, you get basically uh, how do you call this? I don't know. Differential equation involving metrics, you know, matrix valid functions. Okay. So it's nothing but just column by column, right? And of course, this you'd have to have an initial condition, so p of zero is p zero. Okay. The reason you do this though is now because you you can um, um, you can um, talk about the determinants of this, right? And the determinant of this is. I mean, you've, you've heard of uh, Vronsky, right? I mean, the determinant of that matrix is actually the Vronsky. Okay? So it's just a matter of, 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 of writing what the determinant of, uh, of the solution, of, I mean, what, the, what is the uh, equation satisfied by the Vronsky? Okay? So the determinant of P is called the Vronsky. Of well, of, of this n solutions. Okay. Now, if you didn't, you know, you probably have seen Vronsky uh, in the context of second-order equations or or nth-order equation. You haven't seen it in the context of systems. <coughs> But it's exactly the same, so I'm just going to make a quick parenthesis here. If I have a second order equation, and actually I'm talking about this in the other class, in the introductory class I'm teaching, um, and you have two solutions, and you compute the Vronsky of those two solutions, what would that, what would that mean? So x1 is a solution, x2 is a solution. What's the Vronsky? Anybody remembers? You put the function x1 and then it's, it's derivative. Okay? x2 and it's derivative. So how, how come is the same thing as that? Well, we like to think of uh, second order equations as first order systems, right? So it's going to be x prime equals y, y prime equals whatever, minus q of t x plus, well, minus p of t y. Just convert it to a system, okay? And then. What will be one solution corresponding to this system? That, if you know a little x1 for for the for the second order equation, what would be the what would be a solution of the system? Well, it's x1 and y1, right? So that's x1 and and x1 prime, because y is x prime. Okay, so that's exactly what. This what this uh, uh, column is, right? It's so this Vronsky is is just by, by putting columns on each column, you put a solution to the system, first order system, rather than the second order equation. Did everybody see that? And x two will be x two y two, so that's going to be x two and x two prime. So you see, what will P be as a matrix? Will be just a matrix whose determinant is the Vronsky. Okay, I don't know. Use brackets for matrix bars for determinant. So the determinant of this is the Vronsky.
Now, do you everybody, uh, anybody remembers what the um, there was a, a f formula for the Vronskin? There was a differential equation that the Vronskin of two solutions satisfied. Mm -hmm. Turns out that the Vronskin plus P of T W, I'm uh, sorry, the derivative of, of W plus P of T W equals zero. So the Vronskin is actually constant e to the minus integral of P of T dt. So how does that relate to what we what we're trying to show in our case? Uh, what's the metrics in this case? What will be the metrics A? Zero one minus Q minus P, right? So the trace of A is actually minus P. Okay. Okay. So the determinant of P, that's the W, is exactly um, well, it's going to equal constant e to the minus integral of the trace of AFT. And the constant is given by initial conditions. Okay? All right. Now, this is not a proof of, of, that, of that thing. I mean, you still, we still have to prove it, but that's sort of the uh, manifestation of this when the system comes from a second order equation. So if your system comes from a second order equation, then you could have T dependent, right? Then uh, you get, this formula just uh, confirms what you had for, for, for second order equations. Yeah? Does anybody remember how to prove that? You use Vronskin and the variation of parameters, yeah. Well, here's just a computation. I mean, it's just look at the Vronskin and you have to know how to differentiate a determinant. How do you differentiate a determinant? We talked about how to differentiate a matrix. A matrix you differentiate term by term. I mean entry by entry. Do you do the same for determinant? No. But how do you do it? Couldn't you do like x one times x two prime minus x two times x one prime? And then just differentiate that? That's exactly what I'm what I'm what I'm saying, but when you differentiate, you get products, right? Product rule. So you're going to be... You've never differentiated a determinant before? Oh, you'll do it now. Um, so instead of going to this explicit mm -hmm. and use the product rule, you differentiate one column at a time. That's the product rule. Okay. So you differentiate the first column and leave the second unchanged, plus the first column and then, then differentiate the second column. Okay, that's product rule for determinants. So x1 prime, x1 double prime, x2, x2 prime, right? So I'll leave, right? And x1, x1 prime, and x2 prime, x2 double prime. Okay? 
you should know this from now on. I mean, it's a kind of a nice um, rule that is just a product rule. And of course, when you when you write it out, it it should give you the same thing, right? Oops, this is W, and this is W prime is blah blah blah, right? And what happens is when you replace x x double prime with what? With what it is in terms of, of x1 prime and x1 as the p and q, what happens is there's going to be a can cancellations occurring to leave you with uh, basically minus p of t w. Okay? I mean, just a computation. I'm trying to see if you can see it really quick. I mean, you just have to replace this by p of t x prime, x one prime, right? Yeah, I don't think you can see it uh, unless you actually do the computation. Okay. So anyway, this is just that um, the situation where the system comes from a second order equation. So back to our, uh, you know, general, like a system that comes from nowhere. It's just the system is given to you. Uh, let's see, where, where, where do we leave it here? Oh, yeah, we... Right, so we said P, of P prime is AP, and I would like to compute the determinant. Well, guess what? How can you compute the determinant here? Well, one way is to say, so back to the metrics, right? P prime equals A P of T. One way is to say what the solution is, right? The solution is uh, EXP of T A as a matrix multiplied by, sorry, P of zero is P zero. Right? Why is that? Well, again, it's column by column. The columns of P naught are those n initial conditions we picked. This matrix hits every column and gives you the corresponding column of the solution. So there's nothing here. But now we can talk about the determinant. The determinant of P T is the determinant of the EXP of T A. Determinant of P naught. So, and now this is just two scalars, two numbers. So this is tray, no, EXP of the trace of TA, right? Determinant of P naught, and that's it. Now, I'm going I'm to talk today about uh, the time-dependent case, so when, when A may depend on time. And an example is just above, right, uh, right, right there, when, when it comes from a, from a second-order equation that's non-autonomous, and you have T in the metrics. Right? So how about, so what happens when... Um, a is actually a function of time, um, then the question is, can you still talk about solutions of this system? Okay? You can talk about solutions of the system. Um, <clears throat> so this would be a non-autonomous but linear system. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
This is non-autonomous linear system. And it fits into maybe the most the most general first order system of differential equations uh, which would be of the form the vector so basically the vector of the variables x1 x through xn the derivatives of those are functions of not only the x1 x through xn but also time right? this is the most general first order system can you think of any 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 anything more general than that well anything you have first order isolate the derivative put everything else in the right hand side okay so this is like the garbage that doesn't involve the derivatives okay so this is actually pretty complicated in general i mean obviously when you have a nonlinear thing right when it's linear next it's linear next means what means the x variables appear only linear so there comes with some coefficients okay and i guess you could have some other terms without x you know so those would be forcing forced forced linear systems right but this is homogeneous linear system non autonomous linear homogeneous Right? Homogeneous means what? Zero is a solution. So the equilibrium is always at zero. There is zero is an equilibrium. Okay, you put in zero, you get. Okay. So uh, there is an existence. There is an uniqueness uh, result. So existence, uniqueness. Um, result for x prime equals f of x t and x holds um, under the uh, hypothesis that f x okay um, so the dependence of the right hand side on this on this variables x1 through xn is c1 is continuously differentiable and t is continuous you say the, the dependence on t is continuous the dependence on x1 x through xn is more than continuous it has to be differentiable and would continue well, it doesn't have to be, but that guarantees that you have a solution and it's unique and all that. Okay? It is exactly the same proof, actually, as when there's no t dependence. Okay? So, what's, what will be an example of this? Well, I don't know. Give me a. You know, x prime is t times something like that, and y prime is, you know, huh? 2y plus cosine of t, I don't know. That would be forcing. But anyway, right? So what do you look for when you, uh, when you see a system like this? Well, does t appear like nice and uh, in a continuous fashion? Or is the right hand side depending on t continuously? Is the uh, dependence on x and y in a continuously differentiable fashion? Well, as I said, for that you would have to so f. 
of t and x y, which is t x plus y squared, two y plus cosine t. Um, what does it mean as c one in x and y? It means partial. You can take partial derivatives with respect to uh, x and y in both components, and those partials are continuous. Okay. So, so that's, it's an easy test. Um, of course, the hard thing is to, just like in the autonomous case, is to prove this. But as I said, that, let's not worry about it, the actual proof at this point, um, but just focus on, you know, uh, OK, now we know that there is a solution and it's unique. How do we represent it or other things, right? So I want to focus now on um, this linear, OK? Right-hand side is linear in x. When it's linear in x, but there's a some time dependence. Do this guy, I mean, do you have a continuous, do you have a solution? Right? Natural, the natural question is, do you have a solution? If we do, how do we how do we do, do we have a way of representing it? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. It's got to be an exponent of t a to the t. It would be nice to be like that. Um, that would solve a lot of problems in introductory to OD class. Um, so you would be tempted to say that exp of, well, okay. The first, where do you start? You start from uh, n equals 1, getting the ideas from, well, what do you have? Only one equation. Then it's just x prime equals a of t x then that's separable or even integrating factor and gives you x of t is x naught e to the integral of a of t dt, right? Zero to t s ds, okay? Does everybody know how to get there? Just separation of variables, for instance, is put x prime over x natural log of x has to be integral of a of t and so forth. Okay? So the natural thing to say is, well, um, for n greater than 1, uh, of course, exp of the integral from 0 to t, a of t dt, at ds. You can make sense of that, right? You can integrate a of a of t, and that's entry by entry. You get a matrix, you exponentiate that, and you have to multiply by the initial condition x x naught, and you have to do it to the right, not to the left. Okay. Unfortunately, this is not always true. Um, does anybody know why? I just put quotes on quotes. Certainly, you cannot separate. Well, right. I mean, but that's for systems. That's even out of the question. Um, you know, if you were to differentiate this and and see if it solves the differential equation, where, where would you get a problem? Actually, let's see. Hmm? How, do we, how do we check that this is a solution? Well, let's take the derivative.
right? You'd hope that some sort of a chain rule, uh, excuse me, yeah, chain, chain rule works, so you can exponentiate Well, so that you can exponentiate um, you can differentiate the exponent of something to be the exponent of that thing times the derivative of the exponent, right? And you want to make sure you want to see if you can put that. What's the derivative of the integral of a of s? Well, that's that's clear what it is. Right? It's just A of T. Okay, there's no problem there. The problem is, does the chain rule work for when you have matrices? And I think you run into the problems when the matrices A do not commute. Okay? If the matrices A do not commute, um, what's the problem that you might end up in? You cannot use that property that the exponent of a sum is the sum of the, is the product of the exponents, uh, the exponentials, right? So this is true if a of t1 and a of t2 commute, okay? If they don't, I don't think that's actually always true. I mean, let's let's just imagine. Imagine that the matrix the the, the matrix A changes. Uh, a of t is a for some period of time, and it's another matrix B for another period of time. Right? That's depend on time, right? It's not constant. It changes. Well, let's do that computation really quick. So, what's what's the um, well up to time one? There's no problem, right? Because you have exp of um, so. T A, right? You integrate a constant function between zero and T. So it's T A, right? And we know the derivative is what it is. It's A EXP of T A, right? That's okay. Now let's let's look for T between one and two. Well what's the integral? From zero to T it's gonna be Well, it's the integral from 0 to 1, so that's a plus t minus 1 b. Okay? The question is, is this equal to b exp of a plus t minus 1 b? Well, the integral is from 0 to t, but I'm saying for, for t between these two values, this is what that integral will look like. Is this true? Somebody tell me. Exp of, of this. Well, what's this? This is exp of a minus b plus tb, right? And this is the same as exp of, well, what you would like to be is you would like this to be, uh, let's see. Actually, you know what? It might actually be true. Um, I think if a and b don't, don't commute, this is not, 
not gonna gonna happen. Why? Just have to go back to how do we show this is true? Does anybody remember? The two different quotients. We said this plus t plus h minus this at t divided by h, right? So in this case, you would have t plus h, right? The value at t plus h and the value at, at t. When you do the difference, the things don't commute, so you cannot factor the things the way you want. So I think this is still not true. If you follow that, that, that proof, if A and B don't commute, this is not true. Of course, if A and B commute, then this is true. So false if A and B do not commute. Commute means A, B equals B, A, right? And of course, it's true if A and B commute. Okay. So how do we know when, when things commute and don't commute? Like if I have A of T, well think about that, it was 0, 1, minus Q of T, P of T. Is this, do this commute like at, at some time versus some other time? Like fix, fix some time, T1, fix another time, T2, do this to commute? They won't. Because if they did, so I don't know, zero, one, um, one, one, and zero, one, one, two. Let's see, do these guys commute? Well, if you multiply, this order is going to be. 0, so 1, 2, 1, 3, right? But if you do it in the other order, it's going to be 1, 1. They won't commute, right? They won't commute. Well, you can verify that. Do not commute. So, if you ever tutor somebody in baby OD class, you will know that if P is the, the, if P is variable, it's not constant, right? You don't have a, a kind of a nice well. You don't have an explicit way to write to find solutions, right? Of this homogeneous equation. Okay. If it were constant, then you would have an explicit way of writing a solution. Okay. Okay. So anyway, this is not always true, but the statement still make, is, makes is true. It says there is a solution, uh, but it, it just it, it's a more complicated way of expressing the solution. Okay. Now let, let's just stay a, a little bit in this. Uh, situation when let's say A's commute. So there, there are families of, of matrices that commute. Give me an example. So this is example of not non-commuting, a family of non-commuting uh, matrices. Give me an example where where you have some um, some time dependent matrix matrices any diagonal huh? any diagonal so you can have a t on the diagonal right you can have and then some fixed for instance right so you can have you can have a fixed matrix and then on the diagonal things that change, right? Then, for one time, for another time, you multiply either way you have multiply is going to be the same, right? So that's an example of commuting family. Okay, so is a family where uh, any two members commute. Right? 
AFT1, AFT2. Is always AFT2, AFT1. Okay, anyway, so the question is uh, if you have uh, that situation where you have the say commuting operate commuting matrices then why is it the determinant of PFT is what it is well you have a product of two matrices right So the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. Uh, and then it just takes one more step sort of to say this is the same as the exponent of the trace of the integral of the trace. You can you can make this argument, yeah. Right. So I'll challenge you to think about what happens if you don't have any commutation. So you don't have commuting <coughs> operators. Because obviously it's true, right? The Vronskian of uh, two equal, two solutions of a second order equation satisfy this property, right? Now I want to move just uh, one step forward uh, because when we talk about this. Uh, time-dependent solutions. You might you might say, well, when I when I will ever have to look at a system, linear system that has time-dependent uh, coefficients, right? And the point is that you can actually encounter those systems even if you have an autonomous system. So let me explain that. So I'm going to talk about variational equation um, given. So this is we're talking about a, a, an autonomous system for um, an autonomous system. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't I want it linear. I want it nonlinear. Okay. Of course, linear would be trivial. Nonlinear. So I'm talking about a nonlinear system. Think about pretty much any of the ones you've seen so far uh, where there's no T dependence. Okay. So imagine that it has a nice, uh, well, it has all the nice properties, so unique solutions. Solutions for any initial conditions and all that. Um, and let x of t be a solution. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a picture in like 2D. So in 2D, I, you've seen that um, I've shown you like the Van der Poel. There are there are nonlinear systems for which there are periodic solutions, right? And only one. So, so I'm going to think about uh, so think about this solution as being either a periodic solution or an equilibrium. Okay. We're going to see how it actually. Well, what it means to write this variational equation for each situation. Okay. So either a periodic solution or either periodic or uh, equilibrium. But again, this doesn't, I mean, you can, you can define it for any solution. Okay? So when you have, uh, when you have this, fix a solution, for each T 
for which the solution exists. Okay, so remember that solutions don't necessarily exist for all times. Could be some maximum time ex of existence, but finite. Okay. So, so J is the maximum time, maximum, maximal uh, interval of existence for X of T. Okay. But of course, if it's periodic, it exists forever, right? If it's of equilibrium, it exists forever. So this would be just a case when other things happen, like um, okay. Uh, define a of t to be the linearization around at that point. Okay. Now, what is df again? The Jacobian, right? df is Jacobian matrix. Okay? Now, of f. So it's partial, well, partial of f1 with respect to x1, partial of f1 with respect to xn. And it's, I'm sorry, it's a partial F partial of Fn with respect to x1, partial of Fn with respect to xn. So it's a square matrix representing the Jacobian, right? And it's evaluated where? At this current solution. Okay. So maybe I should just say this is the solution, right? That's in the phase space. Then at each point, this is x of t. Then I'm gonna imagine like we're linearizing the system around that, right? So we're kind of drawing a, a linearization there, right? We're drawing a linearization at each point, right? But we're not actually linearizing because so so this matrix is going to depend on on time, right? Actually, on the solution we picked, and of course, is going to be a function of time. And if that matrix is going to have uh, eigenvalues. You could have eigenvalue the, the number of eigenvalues could change as it moves along, right? So it's a time-dependent uh, uh, function or matrix values function. Okay. Um, so what do we do with this AFT? Well, here's a here's a key. Um, solving. I'm going to use a different name because uh, x is already used for the state variables. Solving for uh, solving this system, time-dependent system, where a of t is part of that, right? Right? Is the matrix coefficient, coefficient matrix, uh, but depend on t? For some initial condition, amounts to or or gives. By the way, this has all the solutions, right? We said it's linear. There's all the solution, right? Gives u of t such that x of t plus u of t. I'll show you in a picture in a second. So when you add to x of t this u of t, the sum of the two, is an approximate solution to 
the original equation, x prime equals f of x, with x of 0 is x0 plus u0. Now, here's what it all means. I'll draw the picture again. And let's say this is where x0 starts, right? So now the question is, if I, if I start with some initial condition, and it's, it's, so this is u0. You will see that the magnitude of u0 is not important. Why is the magnitude not important? Well, if I, if I solve for some u0, and then I take epsilon times u0, I shrink it. What's going to happen with the solution of the linear system? Shrink by the same amount, right? So the size doesn't matter. It's like you have, it's only the direction. Right? So if, if this u0 is like in this direction, let's say, as an example, right? Then you solve this for later times. So x of t is here, and I don't know, u of t is like this big, right? Then what is it saying? It says that if I have start the full nonlinear system, but at that small change in the initial condition, what's going to happen? And I, I follow it with the tip of that, you know, x plus u, right? That's x, x plus u. You agree? This is, how you add, this is how you add vectors, even in 2D or in 5D, right? So x of t is this point, u of t is this vector, right? So x plus u is this point, right? So what, what is the statement that I just made? It says a solution that that connecting this arrows gives you an approximate solution of the full system. Okay? That is, it may not be the actual solution because you don't add, well, you don't add two solutions. Well, you don't, it doesn't work like this for nonlinear systems. You don't add x, which is a solution of this nonlinear system, u, which is not even a solution for that nonlinear system, and the sum is a system of, of the solution of the nonlinear system. It doesn't work like that. But the true solution is not far from that, right? I mean, it just, just follows that, okay? So this would be the true solution. to the nonlinear system. Of course, at that, I don't know if that kind of makes sense to you guys, but it's a very um, important statement to, that, that, that this, that this you know, fact uh, <coughs> makes. It says that when you solve a nonlinear system, right, with an initial condition, and then you change that initial condition by a little bit. Then the solution of the nonlinear system for the changed initial condition can be approximated by this variational by, by solutions of this variational equation. That is, just keep the solution and then add u of t, which solves that time-dependent linear problem. So the green line is the solution through the initial condition x0 plus u0. Of the full system, nonlinear system, right? And these are close to each other. I mean, what does it mean close? That means for a short period of time, they take, of course, they're going to go away. But there is a very specific, um, I mean, the statement, the very precise statement is the following. Uh, precise statement is actually here on this page, uh, it's on page 151, which says the limit as t goes to zero, no, 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 excuse me, no, no, t goes to zero, of, of the size of u naught goes to zero, of, 
the difference between, let's call this y of t minus x of t plus u of t is zero. So let's see if I use colors. This would be the y of t and this would be the x of t plus u of t. Okay. So it's it's remember we said it doesn't matter the size the size I mean the in other words if I double this arrow here I'm going to get a double arrow everywhere right as far as you the red arrow but the um, this approximation works only if, if I make it actually smaller and smaller. So very small variation. It's called a variation from the solution. You make a very small variation from the solution, right? Then the solution of the variational equation indicates the direction in which the solution goes to. Okay? Now, I know it's kind of overwhelming and uh, it takes probably a whole year to really get this and variational calculus. That's, that's actually sort of variational calculus, but let's specialize this to, to uh, x of t is, is an equilibrium of some, some, some uh, nonlinear equation system. Okay. What does that mean in that case? Well, what is the variational equation in that situation? Well, it would be u prime equals a of t u, where a of t is the is the Jacobian matrix at that equilibrium. Equilibrium doesn't change, right? I mean, uh, as, t as time evolves, that solution doesn't change. So this is actually constant. Right? So that's exactly what I told you last time. That is, this is a linearized, this is the linearized system around the equilibrium. Okay. No more time dependent, just time independent. Okay. So what's the statement going to uh, saying then? Well, it basically says that if I have the picture here of the fully, fully nonlinear system, okay? And I have an equilibrium, let's say, over here, okay? Then how do solutions that are nearby behave? Well, The linearization about the x star is going to have, is going to take that, well, is going to have the zero as being the equilibrium. Okay? So that's where the u is. And now let's imagine, let's say we go uh, this much away. I used red. So let's say, let's say we go this much away, right? In the u direction, right? So this means it's like, this is u, right? Well, how's the evolution of that in the linear system? In the linear system, I don't know. Let's say it's a saddle, right? If it's a saddle, then it should be going like this, for instance, right? Then it means that it's a, so. This is u naught. 
This means that at some later time, u of t is going to be that much, right? So this, this basically says that it's going to follow the same pattern in the nonlinear system. Well, it may not actually be the exact, so that we, I used green for the exact solution may actually be kind of off, but it's going to be, be close to the actual linear pattern, right? So if I do this for all the u naught, for all the possible perturbations, then you, let's say this is the pattern in the linearized system, right? Then what will be the pattern in the nonlinear system? I don't know, it may be skewed, right? But it's less and less skewed the closer, the smaller the u naught is. Okay? So all this is saying is that you can, uh, it doesn't necessarily say that you have a uh, conjugacy yet between the linear, the nonlinear system around the equilibrium and the linearization around the equilibrium. Okay? In fact, there, that's true also that there's conjugacy. But the solutions behave, they're very, they're close to each other. Good approximations, yeah. So they don't have the same equilibrium point? No, no, no. The, right, so any, exactly, so any point here, any equilibrium point, when you linearize, the linearized system will, will be zero, will correspond to zero. Right? So here's y of t, and that's if we want to say it's close to x star plus u of t. Okay. So if you want to think about a way of um, translating the equilibrium to the origin, it would be exactly by this. Right? It would say, let's introduce um, introduce so um, so given x star, um, introduce um, u equals um, x minus x star, change of variables, right? Then you would have, uh, what do you have here? Then you have um, x star and x, right? When you, when you introduce u, it's going to be uh, corresponding to 0 and the difference. So this is u x minus x star, right? But you not only change the variables, but you also re linearize. So you change the system from being x prime equals fx to u prime equals df at x star u, okay? It's not just a translation, okay? The, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop. But if you look on the um, P plane, for instance. Remember, you say you find a equilibrium point by clicking, and then you say, "Show me the linearization." It pops up in a separate window. Just imagine it's a separate window, right? It's a, it's it's not a change of variables per se. It's just kind of it just shows the the behavior near the equilibrium, right? But yeah, it's 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 always zero because. Um, because that's what that's what that u you know u is the departure from the equilibrium okay the direction of the departure from equilibrium it's this is this kind of distance right I mean this is this direction okay um, let's see I think Wednesday I'm I'm gonna um, finish sort of discussion on chapter eight so that will leave us chapters nine and ten after spring break. Um, chapters 9 and 10 will talk about 
some techniques that graduate students will need for the, for the uh, for the project. But this doesn't mean I mean you, you should already be able to start you know looking at the projects over the spring break, um, kind of formulate the problems, you know decide on what models to do. So you won't have all the techniques in place to to actually uh, approach those problems uh, and. and Finish the, the project, but um, I think you just talking about you know the systems and how you can you know um, analyze equilibrium and periodic solutions and so forth is is um, and we're we'll talking we're going to talk on um, Wednesday about some more of this. Okay, so I think we're still on track time-wise, but um, um, I'll also talk about a little bit about how this. For periodic orbits, uh, here you, you saw how it's actually doing for equilibrium, right? For equilibrium, it shows uh, the linearization just shows you know the pictures are are the, are similar, right? Are close to each other. But uh, what what does it mean for a periodic orbit to do this variational equation? Okay. It's very important stuff, and it's I don't know it's it's uh, it's happening everywhere, like in mechanics. If you heard of second variation, um, and that's uh, anyway, it's in var variation of calculus a lot. Use this a lot. So, um, I want to sign any homework yet. So we'll see Wednesday how much of that. <laughs>